podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to the next episode of The Therapy Show with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. And we're going to be looking at narcissism, but it's, it's a really meaty subject, this one. I get asked an awful lot about this online, and I, I talk in quite a few groups, uh, particularly one that I'm thinking around, um, with uh, alienated parents kind of saying that their partner is narcissistic and asking me how they can prove it. <laughs> so maybe maybe I'll point them in the direction of this episode <laughs> where we can discuss all that. <laughs> it's it's oh a word that's handed around an awful lot. If it's not people, you know, talking about being gaslighted or gaslighting, narcissistic, you know, the disorder... I talk about narcissistic tendencies, which I think we all have, you know, to a certain extent. So over to you, Bob, where do you want to take this conversation? Well, of course, healthy narcissism is the basis of self-esteem. Yeah. So, you know, this podcast is more about narcissism at a disordered level or a trait level, you know. If you want to talk about negative narcissism, your toxic narcissism, we could do. Um, but this is what the podcast is going to be about. So let's take the definition of narcissism. Let's go back into Greek yeah. mythology. So narcissist, um, you know, the gods um, gave him, if you like, internal beauty. And uh, that was his... Uh, that was his uh, destiny, eternal beauty on one, one clause. And that is, if he ever looked at his own features, he would wither away and die. Now, of course, what he did was, he did look at his own features through a reflection and a pool. And he did wither away and he did die. And in this place, of course, you've got the flower called narcissist. Yeah. So that's the sort of, that's the sort of background to the definition of nars a narcissist or narcissism, if we're going to talk about in this podcast. So it comes from the Greek mythology, the term, and it's very much seen in the literature as somebody who um, is the centre of their own universe. So in other words, they uh, see themselves as extraordinarily special. They see themselves right at the center of their own universe and they have a high sense of entitlement. Now, somebody with a narcissistic disorder, you don't usually see in therapy. No. Because they're too, um, anybody who's perfect, especially at that level, wouldn't come to therapy. Yeah. So you That's don't one really- of the things I always say. I work with people who have parents that display narcissistic tendencies and partners of somebody that displays that behavior yeah so if i think of you know i've i have worked with of course narcissistic people across the spectrum from if you a mild narcissistic tendencies all the way up the spectrum probably to a disordered level now the more disordered they are the more unlikely they are to come to therapy of their own volition yeah. in fact you would hardly ever see them. Yeah. So I probably think, I always think of two people practically at least of the high narcissistic order, still not a disorder in the sense of being fixed, lacking spontaneity and rigid with an element of psychosis, but pretty high in that continuum of what I call a, a, a narcissist. Now, the first person came to therapy because he came with his then partner and really, um, I would say his partner sent him to therapy, but he didn't come, he didn't seek me out saying I want an individual therapy. The other person I'm thinking about was in training, believe it enough to be a psychotherapist and had to, by definition, 
have some therapy. Yeah. So there's neither of them came of their own volition. That's interesting. Yeah. At the high end of narcissism, you will never see them. Yeah. So you're right. Usually you'll see people of narcissistic traits. And again, I just repeated the second narcissist I'm thinking about. High narcissists came because they they were in training to be a psychotherapist. That's interesting in itself, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was meaning, was interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, let's look at the features of somebody who's coming in with this frame of reference. Um, perhaps it's, we won't say a disorder level because I don't think you'll see them. Perhaps with people who are quite high up the continuum, uh, they've certainly got quite very intense traits. And let's go through of the through a few of the features, if you like. So I've got a list of them here. Let's start off with the first one: grandiose self, a grandiose sense of self-importance. Yeah. So grandiosity means an inflated sense of your own worth. So that's when somebody um, uh, talks about themselves in an exaggerated manner. You know, I have the most wonderful sense of humor. I've got uh, an IQ of 183. In fact, I think the reported, uh, last reported sense of IQs, I was the second highest in the United Kingdom. Yeah. And you know what? I'm not afraid of telling people about my level of intelligence. So they know how intelligent I am. So do you see the grandiosity there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They might work for a company, but say that they, the company couldn't run without them or the, the backbone of everything, yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 that's right. So there's huge grandiosity and a self, an inflation of the self. Yeah. So that's really important. So uh, any sense of person who comes from a narcissistic sense will be grandiose to a certain extent about their self-worth, their level of specialness. Yeah. And usually often about their level of qualities like intelligence or beauty, or we could list the different qualities. Um, and you just gave a good example. Somebody who came along and said, right, this business will collapse without me. I'm totally indispensable. Yeah. So there's a grandiosity in the way of looking at things. So why wouldn't any woman be attracted to me? You know, um, I, I always dating sites, I can't believe them. I mean, if I went on a dating site, blimey, I, I, I'd have them all, all wanting to um, fall over and swoon at my feet. Quite right, quite right. But the interesting thing is, if they were on a dating site and nobody swiped left or right or whichever way you swipe to, to get a match, Mm. They wouldn't take responsibility for that. It would be a rubbish dating site. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It reminds me of a, uh, somebody who's narcissist tendencies I was thinking about who, um, you know, had a series of dates and couldn't understand why um, they, they didn't want to meet them again. Yeah. And then when we were talking it through, we we found out that the dates that he had, he talked about how marvellous he was for the whole of the two hours over the meal. You know, I'm a super athlete. I have been to the most out wonderful places in the world. I've, you know what, I know uh, many, many chefs who've got seven Michelin stars. And do you know, I've walked up, you know, I've had a restaurant, whatever it is, you yeah. know, and they spend the whole date talking about themselves and their super achievements. And they don't understand why the person doesn't come back for a second date. It is completely not even their, in their awareness that the other person might feel completely discounted and no, and, uh, 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 and there's never been any question about how they are. Yeah. But they don't, they don't even, they do not even think about it like that. See, that's the thing. When I talk to people about narcissism, it's kind of like it's not that they're aware of it. 
and they do it anyway. They're aware of discounting the other person and they still do it. It's kind of like they don't even get the fact that they are discounting the other person. It's not in their awareness at all. It's not in their awareness. And it's a really important point to be aware of. And the reason why that is, and the reason why that is, is because they are protecting themselves against their own real self. And their own real self, if you ever got to it, would be uh, feeling depressed, inadequate, devalued, and extraordinarily sad. Mm. Now, they, it's really important they go, well, nowhere near that. Yeah. So in many of the, much of the literature, they, you know, they'll talk about a real self and a false self. So they create this level of grandiose self uh, yeah. so that they will not have to go anywhere near their perceived sense of inadequacy. Yeah. And then they kind of build a fortress around that false self so that nobody can penetrate it. Well, at least, at least alone themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I said, a lot of people I speak to, it's kind of like, it's really difficult to get across to them that it's it's just not in their awareness no. how their behaviour impacts on the other person. It's not that they know they're doing it and they do it anyway. It it's just not on the horizon at all. No, it's in transaction analysis terms. They're in a, they're they're coming from the child ego state from a part of themselves which is they're not really aware of. Yeah. Um, this is another language. This is a, a coping system. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit maybe about how a narcissist is born, so to speak, where it comes from? Why, why are certain yeah. people narcissists and others aren't? Fine, but let's just go through the features first. Is that OK? okay. okay. No, I quite happily do that um, because it's, it's important to look at um, and before I talk about that briefly, narcissists are usually born from narcissists. But I can talk about them in a minute about that. Yeah, the yeah. second one is uh, they are preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Yeah. Absolutely. So they fantasize a lot about, you know, how successful they are how powerful they are, how they can just have, like I've just said, all, 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 all the uh, desirable women in the world. The pe people will find them, uh, the person very, you know, a sense of beauty, absolutely overwhelming. Um, and they spend a long time fantasizing about that. It's one of the dangerous things about these people that they actually do achieve an awful lot because of the belief around it oh that's a very good point uh, most people who've got narcissism at this level are usually extremely successful people yeah. extremely powerful people yeah. and they surround themselves with people who actually reinforce that narcissism so the, the sense of grandiosity the sense of perfectness and everything else kind of comes true to a certain extent because they are usually quite successful well they really the, the really important thing is that they surround themselves with people who stroke and support their their sense of narcissism so they yeah. become more narcissistic because one of the things you, you know when i was looking at this for research you not just for this podcast but generally is kind of cult leaders are usually you know fall into this bracket that do have people that worship the ground that they walk on that do believe everything that they say that do follow them you know even into danger that's that's yeah. how idealized sometimes these people can be and they're usually highly charismatic yeah yeah they they, they have a sense of distorted reality in the sense of their own grandiosity um and they will surround them i said again this is a really important point they will surround themselves with people who idealize them yeah. who support their grandiosity so they become more grandiose yeah 
These are not people who um, surround themselves with people who will disagree with them. <laughs> I know you're going to surround themselves with people who actually support, idealize them and believe their grandiosity. Yeah. And it, 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 it's not kind of like you or I could suddenly decide to be narcissistic tomorrow because we, we would have a sense that we were making it all up we you know this this happens early on so it, it's not that somebody can suddenly become a narcissist i think a person can actually create a, a a sense of self which is narcissistic how long they can keep that up is another story um i yes you're correct in, in the sense of real real person has narcissistic injuries will have a distorted sense of reality so uh you know it's very hard for people to play that yeah yeah that's what i was meaning to keep yeah. up that pretense yeah so yeah. Them, yeah it's the same with all these disorders if you ask somebody to play somebody being obsessive for example or if you ask somebody to play somebody being highly withdrawn you might do it in a role play but you wouldn't be able to do it for long no no so it's the same with all these disorders, all these um, types of clients we're talking about. So they have, so I just repeat this feature, they have a great sense of fantasy about wealth, success, power, and this feeds them internally. Yeah, this feeds themselves internally because they have to have the internal strokes, if you like, or recognition internally to keep the grandiose self going. The other thing we need, of course, is a uh, supply of what in TA we would call positive strokes. In other words, a supply of people who will idealize them, yeah. who will say they are wonderful, tell them how special they are. And if that supply starts to wither away they will start getting in touch with their internal depression their fragile sense of self and their internal hopelessness and go into what i'll call a deep depression what other people might call a narcissistic injury where there's a narcissistic collapse and they and they they go to bed or they capacitate themselves or they find it difficult to function. So they have to surround themselves with people which give them this type of recognition. Interesting. Mm. Especially if you think about therapy. Yeah. <laughs> because they will need, we'll get on to how you work with these people but they need the therapist to um, support the narcissistic frame of reference. Otherwise, they feel this acute sense of shame, humiliation, depression. Uh, they fall straight into a black hole of shame and you won't see them again. So, yeah, that, that's one of the reasons I would have thought why they won't come to therapy <laughs> yeah they won't they won't you know, they, they might come a couple of times but as soon as you start to chink their armor they're they're off yeah chink their armor what do you mean by that when they when you start to do what well the, in a therapeutic setting if you're not you know buying into the game if if you're oh, not okay. idealizing them and believing every yeah. word that they're saying they will see that as something wrong with me i would imagine and right. come back again <laughs> you won't see them so the treatment which i'm not going to probably never get, not going to get into this podcast but the treatment is to do exactly what we're talking about here which we'll get onto later you need to idealize them but i'll explain how you do that through an actual um term uh which cohort who specializes in narcissism called and that is empathic attunement I'll, I'll probably talk about that at another time. In the TA world, 
empathic transactions. Um, but let's go on to another feature of uh, uh, somebody who, who, who comes to our, uh, our room, our clinical practice with this um, framework, and that's a need for specialness. They, above all, have to be special. Yeah. And they have to be special to the therapist as well. They have to have people who will admire them. They have, they, they have to have people surround people who uh, well, will admire them and be loyal to them, and tell them how wonderful they are, and continue many, many times in different ways, reinforcing this sense of specialness. Yeah. And I, I would imagine as well, you know, it, even in the therapy room that you couldn't compare them to another client or not that you would compare clients, but do you know what I mean? That if I said, you know, I've worked with clients like you before, for example, that wouldn't sit well with them because that would mean that they aren't unique and special. Unless you're correct unless you're talking about a different type of narcissist. So there's different types of narcissists. There's closet narcissists yeah. and exhibitionist narcissists, which I'll also talk about in a minute. So in general, you're correct with a caveat. Yes. And, and, yeah. and you're generally correct. I remember somebody who's highly narcissistic who um, I asked them to, I don't think if I was thinking very well at this particular time, um, or I just didn't occur to me. I, I've seen them for only three sessions, um, but I asked them to wait outside while I was finishing off work. Ooh, another, not good. <laughs> with another client. And um, when they came in, they spent the next, first 15 minutes at least raging at me about how they have felt humiliated. Mm how they felt um, in the pecking order, uh, discounted. How could I do this to them? And it was, I assure you, Jackie, it was at least a 10 minute rant um, out of huge proportions. And uh, I learned from that. I mean, I knew this anyway, but I really learned from this to, to exactly what you've just said there to make sure you don't leave them in waiting rooms yeah. or you know you see them so if they're coming at two o'clock you meet them at the door or you ask them straight up yeah yeah <laughs> because if you don't and we, we do things like i did or even what you just suggested they will go into a real what i'm going to call narcissistic rage yeah but I feel like I need to say say something about the relationship that you had with them that they came in <laughs> in the first place. Yeah, well, yeah, that, you know that they didn't yeah. just leave in utter distaste and. Well, I tell you again, <laughs> it's into the treatment of narcissists, but you know you have to you have to you know get into their frame of reference in the service of attunement. Yeah. Now, if you can get into their frame of reference in the service of achievement of coming alongside them, they'll calm down really quickly. Yeah. The problem for therapists is if they go into some sort of battle or go into some sort of parent process or some counter transferential uh, place where the uh, actual client doesn't feel met, uh, then they they're into a losing wicket yeah so it, it's I haven't seen a narcissistic person in the therapy room but I would imagine it's exhausting and really quite difficult to meet their needs at the level that they want them to be met at and still yeah keep your sense of self in that transaction yeah you need to start off from a position which is this that it's impossible to do what you just said yeah you know so therefore if you're starting from that position that is impossible to meet their needs you can't provide the needs uh 
you're in a better frame of reference. Another way to look at it also is this injury we're talking about happened a long time ago mm -hmm. and we need to get to that injury. So if you look at it that type of way and we think about the injured child and the client that's got to produce or defend by having a grandiose sense of self and needs to be admired and needs to be special at all costs, then hopefully the therapist's compassion might save the day. A question's just come up, Bob, and I'm not sure if you know the answer. <laughs> Are narcissists usually only children? Is there any relation to being an only child and a narcissist? I'm not quite sure what the question is, but uh, I'll answer it the way I'm going to answer it, and then you can say that's not the question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I'll answer it as much as I can. Um, they don't really have access to much adult in the clinical room. So usually what you're actually coming across is a younger sense of self, which is defending against the, the, um, the real self being actually met. So their adult usually goes out of the window in therapy. Is that what you meant? No. Well, tell me, say it again in a clear <laughs> way that I can understand. I meant that. in a family unit. Are there any statistics that only children are more, more likely to have narcissistic tendencies? Oh, you mean real children rather than yes. psychological yes. Actually, uh, in, okay. in the family. Yeah, so are you Socially, saying yeah. real children? Okay. You're saying to me, is there any statistics that show that real children have, uh, say that again to me, still not quite clear. If only children, if, if mum and dad just have one child, statistically, yeah. are they more likely to have narcissistic tendencies than if they're one of five children, say, for example? Oh, that's a clear, okay, I can, I can tell you what I think about that. I haven't read much research on this. I don't know the statistics, but I can tell you my thoughts, especially as I have an only child. So Jessica, as my daughter is 22, um, is an only child, right, okay? I think she's got histrionic traits and not narcissistic traits, and I think there's a difference. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I think only children fall into a challenge often by the parents in that the parents uh, may not allow the child to grow up. They may allow them to keep them uh, young and not equip, equip them with the social uh, skills, if you like, to deal with relationships in later life. But that's, that's the, that's the prof profile more of a histrionic. And I think, I think the Jessica has to histrionic traits, even though she was brought up by two psychotherapists. Interestingly, and we'll talk about this in another podcast, particularly uh, the misdiagnosis of hysterics with narcissists. But I think Jessica is more in the world of the hyst hysterical traits rather than narcissistic traits. So I don't know the statistics, I don't know the research, but um, I understand the query. Yeah, because there's, there's something about them not separating out appropriately. You, you said earlier on about narcissistic people often have narcissistic children. Correct, yeah. Yeah. So is yeah. that are, are you saying that that's potentially learnt behaviour or the fact that they feed each other's narcissism? Well, you're right. I mean, I'm not sure it should be this podcast, but rather than the other one when we look at the diagnosis and treatment plan of narcissists. But we are going back to what is called the individuation separation phase, usually called the rapprochement, say, rapprochement stage in, in the French uh, terminology. Uh, which is really one and a half to probably three and a half, where the child starts to differentiate out and starts to separate. And if things go wrong um, in that time period, then different challenges will occur. Now, if you think about it this way, that say you've got a narcissistic parent and they feel wounded 
when the actual child needs to separate normally, yeah. healthily, in an yeah. individuated way. Um, and the person who's narcissistic feels wounded by that. They may deny the child the strokes and validation to grow up, but give them strokes and validation if they come back and stay infantilized and look after the mother. Yeah, yeah. So that's some of the problems you can get there. And um, um, uh, from that, many things can happen. But if they're kept young and they aren't allowed to grow up, then you've got problems, haven't you? Yeah, which in my mind, that, I think that's the reason why I asked, you know, as, as well as the way that the narcissist displays their behaviour, you know, th that would make sense if they're not allowed to grow up. And, and you know, being a parent of an only child, I'm not, I've got three kids, but if I was, I would imagine that you want to keep them close. You know, if this is your only child and your protege and everything else, there's going to be a lot of that. You know, it might not, the danger is you may, like you've just said, you may not give them the strokes, the recognition, the validation they need to actually separate. To be and independent. Yeah. And you may unconsciously, out of your awareness, give them strokes for actually staying uh, young. Yeah. yeah. A good person on all this is Margaret Marler who is uh, probably one of the best uh, psychoanalytical child development people I know who talked about this. Cohort's another person who talked about this. And when we get to the next podcast on diagnosis and treatment and features of the narcissist, we can perhaps talk more in depth about that. Um, but at the bottom level of narcissistic traits or disorders is what's called in the literature, the empty core. In other words, I get sad when you say that, Bob. That really makes me feel sad. Because they feel like um, inadequate, hopeless, uh, abandoned, you know, uh, uh, and feel that they have no identity. Yeah. And that is why they defend the way they defend. Grand grandiosity being special and another feature they need is they require excessive admiration from everybody around them trying to fill that empty core correct that's exactly it trying to fill yeah. that empty core yeah now it's impossible because no one can do it there because is no amount the, of that that no can fill the it injury out. was the injury was in their history yeah not, no, in fact, I think of it, I think of a narcissistic class who talked about nothing, you know, uh, whatever they did was not enough. They had to be so perfect. If they weren't perfect, perfect, um, they wouldn't get the validation. So by being perfect and by being special and by being a high achiever, they got some validity and strokes, but it was never enough because they couldn't be perfect enough. Yeah. And couldn't be special enough. Yeah. They could get it to a certain degree, so they would seek out, they had memories of, you know, their mother or their father coming and reading books to them and could tell them special stories, but it would always be linked to achievement, uh, being perfect, being special, um, doing wondrous things. Yeah, which they can't maintain. So it's kind of like I see it is they get the juicy recognition and validation, but it's not long enough. It doesn't last long enough. They need it again and again and again because it's right. just not enough. Yeah. No satisfaction. Yeah. Short lived. <laughs> yeah, because there's no satisfaction because the parents want them to be even more perfect, even more special, even, yeah. even more unique. Yeah. And if, and if they can't do those things, they fall into desolation which is what is called the narcissistic injury like i say it it, it, do, it makes me sad <laughs> so yeah. is there any other anything else that you wanted to say to finish up on this episode yeah i want to talk about 
uh, interpersonally explo uh, exploitative. In other words, um, narcissistic people look or it will often appear cold, calculating and exploiting other people. Now, have I got five minutes left? You have. Okay, uh, or perhaps we have. Okay, let's start it here. Maybe we'll have to finish it in the next podcast. But there's a wonderful uh, psychoanalyst. Well, really, she's, she's now a Gestalt psychotherapist. I think she must be about 80. Uh, Eleanor Greenberg and she's she is a Gestalt psychotherapist now she lives in New York and she's written extensively about narcissism and actually the borderline condition and she has a monomic an easy way to remember um, the characteristics of, uh, of a narcissistic personality um, uh, you know if somebody walks walks through the door those sorts of traits and it's special God special god so these are the features you're going to see and it's an easy way of remembering it so s is for splitting yeah so in other words there's a split between the real self and the false self they'll split and so what you're going to experience isn't the real self you're going to experience the false self and you're going to experience this person whose coping mechanism is to actually be very you know she's you know very um, special very uh, all the things we talked about so that's one s splitting and another s uh, splitting or status and i'll explain what i mean by this so narcissists need to um uh, be top of the pecking order. So if a narcissist goes into a room and there's say 15 people in the room, they aren't thinking about things like, oh, I, I wonder if they look very kind or perhaps they're gonna like me or they'll feel a bit anxious because they're in social company. They are gonna look around the room and they're gonna think, well, who's number one around here? I am. Yeah. So they have to be one in the pecking order. They'll only ever be two if they're, they're what we're going to call a closet narcissist, which might go on to the next podcast as well. Um, and they allow the exhibition narcissist to take the alpha position. But basically, they um, clock everything, everything in social circumstances in terms of a pecking order. So if they're in a training group, so you 16 people like you were in and like I was in my own training for four years, they would need to be number one or at least number two. And they don't think about in terms of levels of intimacy, where they're going to get on with people, but they think about in terms of alpha male and being the top dog. Yeah. And you will see that in Love Island. Do you, you watch Love Island, Bob? Yeah. Have you seen the program? I, I like to think I look at it from psychological points of view. My daughter um disagrees with me but anyway um it, you, you watch love Island, you watch all those alpha males mm. and how they rate themselves or may not may not rate themselves in pecking order but somebody who's got narcissist traits will rate themselves in pecking orders and that's how that's how they operate in, 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 in a social environment so status is number one for them so e special Let's go down the line. E. Have we done P? What's the P? Oh, P is perfection. Perfection. They have I'm to be writing perfect. these down as you're doing them, Bob. Oh, right. Sorry. They have, <laughs> to, they have to be perfect. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. There is a part. Is this, let's go back to something else about S's. There's a, there is another S there that's often brought into this by Eleanor Greenberg, and that's sensitivity. Now, people don't often think of sensitivity when they think of narcissists, but they are very, very, very intensely sensitive about slights of humiliation. So that person that I left inadvertently outside the wait waiting room felt they had been humiliated, shamed, and they were very sensitive to any slights of anybody uh, passing them in the 
um, card, for example, if they pass my card and say, oh, how are you? You're, how are you then? Oh, uh, I've seen you come to therapy or whatever it is. So they're very, very, very sensitive to the uh, most acute sense of, uh, uh, of transactions. Uh, they're not sensitive to other people. They're not sensitive at all to other people. No. They're the complete opposite. But yeah. to themselves, they can't take any slights. So we can have splitting status and sensitivity up there. Yeah. Be perfection. Yeah. Have to be perfect. Now we've talked a little bit about that, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Now that's really interesting. So therefore, they need to be a perfect client. <laughs> Which is a really interesting one. I was just going to say, how did he work that one out then in a therapy? Well, if I were coming to therapy in the first place in a way, but also they expect the therapist to be perfect, which is also another story. But, they, but the, the, what they want is a lot of validation from the therapist for coming in the first place, for um, doing therapy perfectly, doing the homework well, and everything that, that goes with that. And that's yeah. an important thing to remember for down the line. Yeah. The next e, e yeah. is entitlement. They have a huge sense of entitlement, yeah? Yeah. So I talked about that earlier. But what about envy? Envy goes with entitlement. It's another E. So interestingly enough, they can get very envious of other people. Especially the closet narcissists will get very envious of exhibitious narcissists, even though they don't show it. But they'll also be envious um, of other people in this pecking order system that I'm talking about. Next one is C, is it? Yeah. yeah cold and calculating. Mm. So they're very cold and calculating people externally. What's interesting about sensitivity is they have no sensitivity to other people because they lack empathy. Yeah, yeah. They have no sense of empathy with other people. Now, Elena Greenberg talked about a story in her article about this. And she's one of her clients who's narcissistic, came in and ranted and raved, if I want to use those away, had a narcissistic ranting and raving session about um, just before they came up to the actual therapy room, they'd gone from a burger next door. And the waitress had given the client um, mustard on their, their beef burger instead of tomato. And the uh, client felt humiliated, slighted, shamed, and yelled and screamed and tried to get the, uh, the waitress sat. Wow. And then came up to the therapy room and ranted and raved at the therapist about how they felt shamed, humiliated, and could the therapist go round and sack, make sure that this waitress had been sacked. So how does, what does a the therapist do? Now what Greenberg said, and again we'll talk about it again, but what Greenberg said she did was she had to decenter from any thoughts about the feelings of the waitress and center on the shame and humiliation that the narcissistic person must have felt in the service of getting alongside the child in the client and the earlier injury. Interesting. That's an interesting example, which we'll talk yeah. more about, about how you treat narcissists and how you work with them. Because, you know, to decenter from the poor old waitress was enough, but. Yeah. Um, you must keep away from that as a therapist and go to the feelings and the terms of reference from the uh, the shamed, humiliated um, client. Wow. Does that, Come that on, Bob, this is a very long five minutes. Aye. Idealizing transference. I'm sure, sorry this is a long podcast. But I'm enjoying it. it I've, I've got so much information from this. Yeah, idealising transference. So they need so they need to idealise you. Now, that's an interesting one we've just talked about, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, so they need to see you as a super therapist who never gets anything wrong. 
no pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you need to be as special as them or even more. So they can take a picture of you and take it to their, their bedroom or their lounge or wherever it is and frame it and look adoringly at you every night and say, you know, I'm in safe hands here. I'm with the best therapist in Manchester. And why? Because in terms of number one, protection. They'll feel safe and secure that they're with the best. Yeah. Not the best. Yeah, idealizing trans. Eventually, of course, which is down the line from this, this uh, podcast, they need, of course, to see that um, that everybody's normal, including themselves, which is actually the um, real goal of psychotherapy, that uh, all humans make mistakes, including themselves, and that is normal. Yeah. But that's down the line. What's next? Did I special... A. Well, a, A, I think that's admiration. Just look at this. this uh, yeah, we've had that admiration. They need to be acknowledged, admired, everything else that goes for that. L is for low self-esteem. Having the, the, the real self has incredible low self-esteem. And that's why they defend in such an incredible, grandiose way. So that you'll never, ever 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 suspect that yeah let alone uh work with it so and uh, god stands for grandiose omnipotent defense Ooh, omnipotent like that one all powerful like a god grandiose omnipotent defense that's their defence. So I quite uh, like that. Whether, I've not heard it put like that before. It's a, you know, the, the special God and what it all stands for. It's quite a good way of remembering things, yeah. yeah to think of how you would work with the narcissist. So I apologise slightly going over time in your podcast, but I think it's a really important monomic. If anybody's really interested in a therapist out there working with narcissists I suggest you look at Bellina Greenberg for people who's listened to it about you know maybe how you know um, narcissistic profiles I hope you can find some compassion yeah because without compassion I wouldn't work with them no and it is that scared child it is when you know as soon as you said about that emptiness inside <laughs> That it that really triggers something in me. That, you know, that, yeah, we need to be empathic towards them, even if they're not empathic towards us. Yeah. So let's move on to the second podcast next time we show, and I want to talk about how you work with these people, uh, because uh, that this is just as important as being able to spot them. Yeah. So we'll finish this one and then we'll come back looking at how we work with them. Yeah, how to work with a narcissistic person. I can't wait to learn, Bob. I haven't, I haven't seen anybody, so I've got a lot to learn here. So we'll be back very shortly. Well, in a week's okay. time. Yeah, speak soon. Speak Bye -bye. soon. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.